Ah, buonasera, <ride> lieta di vedervi tutti qua, anche se adesso con queste lampade vi vedo un po' meno, però so che ci siete e mi è veramente un grande piacere. Ogni volta si rinnova questo momento magico di trovarci tutti insieme con questa voglia di incontrare persone, e scambiare idee, confrontarci su una cosa che a noi di Mitte e Media Guru sta particolarmente a cuore, che è, è, è la... come dire la comprensione di questa nostra epoca, di questo nostro modo di vivere, di, della nostra società, quindi in compagnia di personaggi che ormai da 11 anni ci seguono su questo, con questo programma, eh, anche questa sera siamo qua e anzi accoglierei con un applauso Luigi Ferrara che è lì nella penombra, dal Canada, nome italianissimo ma canadese, di Toronto, perché è lui l'ospite di questa sera. Lasciatemi dire alcune cose, eh, come di consueto e di rituale, ma non è un rituale che per me è scontato, perché Media Media Guru veramente lo si realizza grazie all'energia all e al sostegno di alcuni partner molto, molto, molto particolari e cari, perché ci hanno veramente accompagnato in questi anni e con i quali vorremmo andare avanti ancora per i prossimi dieci anni. Quindi cito Artemide, cito Fastweb, Fondazione Fiera, Comune di Milano, Camera di Commercio di Milano e anche la Fondazione Caripro che ci ha dato il patrocinio. Eh, in particolare poi questa edizione, questa puntata con Luigi Ferrara fa parte di un ciclo nuovo, un format che Mediaguro insieme all'Istituto Without Boundary George Brown College ha realizzato, si chiama Future Ways of Living, i modi futuri di vivere e, e che è stato diciamo, un format avviato l'anno passato ma che in qualche modo ha interessato eh, in particolare la triennale che come sapete quest'anno ha riportato a Milano l'edizione internazionale, la ventunesima edizione internazionale con un tema molto importante, design after design. Io sto aspettando di vedere se c'è Andrea Cancellato, il direttore che mi ha chiamato. Ah ecco Andrea, scusami non ti avevo visto. Eh, la, la, appunto, la, quindi ti prego di venire qui accanto un secondo per un saluto perché è importante è su, è più, più autorizzato di me sei tu a parlare della ventunesima a dare un input ventunesima edizione Design After Design e noi abbiamo costruito questo format è un format fatto di incontri internazionali li avete visti scorrere eccoli qui alcuni si sono già, si sono già realizzati eh, Taccara, Mughendi e l'altro personaggio che arrivava dalla Cina oggi è la volta di, di Luigi Ferrara dal Canada e, da, e poi fiuderemo il 27 luglio con una voce internazionale come Ariunda Padurai quindi come vedete siamo passati dalla, dalla voce inglese di Takara alla, al Sudafrica, alla Cina, con Luigi appunto affronteremo il tema del design collaborativo a livello mondiale, a Padurai ci porterà degli scenari e dei racconti e delle voci dall'India e da altri paesi del mondo asiatico. Perché abbiamo fatto questo giro del mondo praticamente? Unitamente a una scuola, un laboratorio che si è concluso eh, ieri e che ha, anzi, abbiamo inaugurato alla Cascina Triulsa, se volete, venerdì, sabato e domenica sempre aperta, questa mostra che dà i risultati di un laboratorio partecipativo diretto da Luigi Ferrara, eh, voluto appunto dalla Triennale di Milano, da Andrea Cancellato in particolare, eh, che è un laboratorio una, che ha eh, disegnato delle possibili idee, suggestioni, vuole dare un contributo per la ridefinizione dell'area Expo e c'è una mostra che rimarrà aperta fino a ottobre. Però Design After Design, dentro il quale Future Ways vive, è ben altro e quindi lascio la parola un attimo ad Andrea Cancellato. Buonasera grazie. a tutti, grazie Maria Grazia, grazie a Luigi. Ma se no, 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 ma se no. Ah, ho capito, saluto a tutti, anche agli altri che ci ascoltano, eh, come si dice, oltremare. L'appuntamento eh, di oggi è, mh, ci sta avvicinando al completamento di questo format, di questo programma di incontri con alcuni protagonisti del design internazionale, eh, per noi di grande rilievo. Eh, il, Interessa ovviamente la connessione fra il tema generale dell'esposizione internazionale XXI secolo Design After Design con il lavoro eh, delle mostre che sono aperte, che invito tutti a non aspettare l'ultima settimana a vedere, sono, sono tantissime diffuse per Milano, Monza, Cinisello, eh, sul sito di Triennale, sul giornale che vi è stato consegnato, troverete tutte le informazioni 
seguite l'oggetto misterioso, lo trovate anche, anche da, da tutte le parti, che vi segnala dove sono eh, tutte le nostre mostre. Ma il, il quadro complessivo che intendiamo sottolineare è questa grande discontinuità fra il XXI secolo e il XX secolo, eh, fra il secolo eh, dello sviluppo, ancorché eh, segnato da due guerre mondiali, e il secolo eh, dell'incertezza, della crisi finanziaria e della globalizzazione che non si risolve, che è frammentato da centinaia di guerre locali che messe insieme fanno forse tanto quanto una guerra mondiale che eh, è segnato da problemi di relazioni sociali, religiose, eh, di caratteristiche nuove rispetto al passato e che inducono eh, il mondo del progetto ad una grande riflessione su temi generali che caratterizzano la nostra società, eh, ne vale, vale la pena soltanto vedere la mostra Neopreistoria 100 Verbi che c'è in triennale per dare un segno in questa direzione, oppure, ed è pure insieme, eh, affronta eh, le grandi questioni eh, della nuova manifattura, come ad esempio la mostra Newcraft che c'è eh, alla fabbrica del vapore, ma dentro questo ambito, dentro questo... Eh, grandi questioni c'è il tema di avere soluzioni eh, che riguardano eh, i problemi di tutti. Luigi Ferrara ci dirà che queste soluzioni non si trovano più solamente nella creatività individuale ma si trovano dentro dei processi condivisi, dentro dei processi nei quali il designer funge da mediatore sociale in una certa misura e quindi contribuisce alla costruzione di queste soluzioni condividendole con chi poi ne deve usufruire. Un esempio per tutti ma che fa riferimento è ad esempio il tema del car sharing, una delle grandi questioni progettate da designer, non è stato progettato da uno specialista di, 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 di soluzioni della mobilità, nasce dentro dei percorsi di design modificando e progettando diversamente le nostre città e i modi di uso delle città. Mi fermo qui perché deve parlare Luigi Ferrara. Buon ascolto a tutti. Grazie al prossimo guru. <ride> Prego. Grazie. No, beh, a parte i ringraziamenti, i temi che ha, che ha toccato Andrea Cancellato sono i temi che hanno, abbiamo cercato di svolgere con le voci appunto dei nostri personaggi precedente invitati, precedentemente invitati. Adesso il discorso lo portiamo avanti con Luigi Ferrara, ci piace. Poi alla fine vedrete che usciremo con una pubblicazione, credo col Sole 24 Ore, una pubblicazione che riunirà un po' tutti questi pensieri, cercheremo un po' di tirare le fila tutti insieme, raccogliendo anche tutti gli spunti, le domande che sono arrivate, lo diceva prima Andrea Cancella, siamo collegati in streaming, ci sono molte persone che ci seguono anche da fuori, quindi eh, grazie. Ora abbiamo unito le forze, mi auguro nello stile è sempre stato quello di essere collaborativo, non certamente eh, puntare ad essere un evento esclusivo eccetera, quindi abbiamo sempre unito le forze, le sinergie, il nostro obiettivo è che la cultura digitale o comunque questa nuova cultura con le problematiche annesse con esse di, si diffonda eh, che, che ne prendiamo coscienza sempre di più che ci ispiriamo sempre di più per arrivare proprio a riflettere sui temi che si diceva e per trovare possibilmente delle, degli spiragli delle, delle soluzioni delle, delle suggestioni che veramente ci aiutino perché alla fine insomma quello che vorremmo è che la nostra società tutte le persone ovviamente vivessero meglio di come stiamo vivendo in questa epoca veramente straordinaria per tanti aspetti ma drammatica per molti altri e allora abbiamo fatto sinergia anche con, con l'ADI, che è l'associazione di design industriale, e con l'ICSID, che è un'associazione mondiale del design industriale. E oggi, ve lo, lo, ve lo annuncio, è la festa, eh, una giornata molto speciale, perché l'ICSID ha indetto la giornata mondiale del design, e in particolare ha dedicato questa giornata proprio ai giovani. Allora Luisa Bocchietto, che è qua con noi, invito a salire subito qua, eh, la presento con grande piacere, la accogliamo l'applauso perché è stata appena eletta, presidente futura dell'Ixid dove prima è stato presidente anche Luigi Ferrara oggi è la giornata mondiale del design dici appunto che cosa è il tuo progetto perché design ormai intendiamo tanto con design 
Sì, eh, mi fa molto piacere essere qui questa sera a poter introdurre Luigi Ferrara che è stato presidente dell'ICSIL, dell'International Council of Society of Industrial Design dal 2003 al 2005. Io sono l'incoming president, sono in panchina in attesa di svolgere la mia funzione e eh, con Maria Grazia Mattei abbiamo pensato eh, di riunire le forze in questa giornata perché da dieci anni ormai questa giornata, il 29 giugno, ogni anno è dedicata al design industriale. In questa occasione è particolarmente importante per Ixit perché c'è anche un grande cambio di, eh, come dire, di visione, di prospettiva proprio in sintonia con quello che prima si diceva e cioè il passaggio dal periodo precedente design industriale al periodo attuale dove il design diventa un sol solvent problem, eh, un, un processo che coinvolge non solo il prodotto industriale ma i servizi e tutta una serie di altre attività che coinvolgono i progettisti, le imprese, gli interventi interlocutori non sono più soltanto i produttori ma diventano le collettività. Tutto ciò ha a che fare con quello che poi Luigi racconterà. In particolare oggi, ogni anno, questa giornata del design ha un tema, il tema di quest'anno è Youth in Design, cioè dedicato ai giovani e noi abbiamo nel pomeriggio fatto una riunione in cui abbiamo invitato i giovani i progettisti a raccontare le loro storie, le loro visioni che siano una proiezione per il futuro. Quindi eh, festeggiamo insieme questa giornata e io chiederei alla regia di mandare un piccolo filmato che eh, vi racconta questo e poi sentiremo Luigi. Grazie, grazie Luisa. Allora via col filmato, poi un applauso. Cioè, eh... condivideremo questo video, ricordiamoci che poi alla fine ci troviamo tutti quanti fuori perché è una giornata di festa. Grazie Luisa e auguri veramente congratulazioni per il tuo nuovo incarico. È il momento di Luigi, Luigi Ferrara prego vieni, Ci siamo in due ad accoglierti questa volta. Allora Luigi Ferrara oltre a essere una persona che conosco da tantissimo tempo, è lungo, potrei raccontarvi un romanzo su Luigi Ferrara, eh, dico soltanto che per chi non lo conosce è stato appunto presidente dell'Ixid, attualmente è Dean, quindi presidente, di, preside di un dipartimento molto importante di design, informatica, new media, moda, eccetera, del polite un Politecnico di Toronto, potremmo definirlo così, che è il eh, George Brown College ed è direttore di questo programma, Istituto Without Wonder, con il quale nel mondo organizza laboratori come quello che si è svolto appunto con la Triennale di Milano, la Cascina Triulsa, eh, di tipo partecipativo per affrontare temi complessi. Benvenuto Luigi, parlerà in 
inglese anche se parla benissimo italiano ma gli diamo la sua lingua principale che è l'inglese oh, okay. no, no, microfonato, no, yeah. benvenuto grazie <ride> thank you what a pleasure to be here tonight what a privilege uh, to be part of uh, two such story things I, the Triennale of Milan was something that uh, I used to read about in books when I was in university and I used to follow the history of it and, uh, and Andrea Cancellato who is I really think a courageous leader of the Triennale who brought back the Triennale to Milan I think let's give him a hand for having done that uh, so it's a privilege for me to be able to participate as a young well now as an old designer uh, in uh, an event like this and uh, another thing that is very dear to my heart is ICSID. Uh, I was elected to ICSID board when I was 36 years old and I became its youngest president when I was 42 and uh, it is something that I think is uh, a very very valid institution to this day and is going to be increasingly important because our world is a, a, a globalized world with interconnections and interactions across uh, across the globe and ICSID is a symbol of that. It's an early symbol of that. It was actually born uh, from uh, Canadian, Italian and uh, French designers thinking that the world needed a world organization for design and I think they were really ahead of their time and that time has come more than ever. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about design after design and about what I call creating a wisdom economy. Right now, we are obsessed with uh, what we call the information economy or the knowledge economy. Uh, and it is here with us. And somehow, with all of this information and all of this knowledge, our problems don't seem to be going away. So, uh, over the years, I've been thinking, what is it that we're missing? What is not here that we need here? And uh, and I think uh, my grandparents' words, my father's words, my aunt who's here with me tonight's words, were always about wisdom, not just knowledge, and not, definitely not just about information. So how do we return to a wisdom economy? How do we move beyond information and synthesize wisdom and bring the correct answers to our problems? I believe that we do that by working together, by co-creating our future and by creating a generative future that allows everyone to participate. I think Andrea really captured it very well when he was describing it earlier. And so I'm going to talk to you about that tonight. Uh, and I'm going to point out, this is an amazing dance that's uh, done by Ariela Vidak and was done last year. Uh, and Claudio Prati, who uh, is part of the creating it, is here tonight. But we really are living in a world of design after design, where visualization, simulation and interaction generate experience, knowledge and transformation. We lived in a world of science and technology and design, and now we're moving to this new world. And this dance is really describing it because Ariella is dancing and she's moving and she's manipulating the data that's attached to her body through sensors in the dance. But in a way that data is also manipulating her. And this is a metaphor for our lives today. We are living in this dance. And this dance is complex. When I was a child, I uh, came to Italy when I was four years old and I, uh, my parents were from Abruzzo and uh, uh, my aunt lived in Milan and so my sister and my mother went to Milan and they got to see the Duomo. And there were these pictures and I looked at them as you know, a five-year-old of people walking on this incredible rooftop of this stone Ah, Gesamtkunstwerk is the only word I can describe it. Uh, and I wanted to be there and I couldn't. I didn't get to go until I was 12 years old. And my aunt was actually able to explain to me at that time uh, that this was a collective work of the people of Milan. And it was built over hundreds of years because it was important to represent 
the shared society that was shared in that community in Milan. And uh, to me, it's always been a symbol. To me, when I go to see it, every time I go to see it, I see something different. When I walked last time to see it, I walked inside and saw the stained glass, and to me, they were home pages. Right? And then I go outside and I see the statues and their avatars, right? It is, it is a miracle, this building, right? And it's a work that is never ending. And really, so are our lives. So are the generations of lives that we live. In fact, our lives are just one giant collective project. We interact with others, we learn from them, we shape their lives, they shape our lives. And, you know, you know, what purpose does this interaction in this collective life have? Well, to me, it seems like it's a project, and it's a project of the growth of our wisdom. In fact, you know, if you look at great literature and you, and you look at uh, great uh, wisdom uh, traditions, it's all about wisdom increasing as you live and you learn. Uh, my dean of the School of Architecture at the University of Toronto used to say to me, intuition is just the accumulation of experience. And it's so true. But I've been embarking for the last 14 years on a project called the Institute Without Boundaries. It was really a gift uh, from Bruce Mao to our school. And when he could no longer uh, run it, he handed it over to me to run. And we've been running it ever since with a team of people who are here in this audience, uh, who are just wonderful people. We're all working on this project of our collective wisdom, and we're working with others to learn more and to really shape and redesign our world and to create new ways of living that will make life better for everyone. And why is design central in that? I mean, we could be doing this in a school of philosophy, as was the case in Greece. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, students got together and they talked philosophy to try to improve world. But there's something special about design, really there's something special because design is actually our original language. If you think about it, literacy, our ability to speak and to read, developed, you know, only so many thousand years ago. And numeracy, mathematics, which is another way we represent our world, uh, developed, uh, you know, after that. And but there was always sensoracy, there were always our senses. And our senses teach us uh, what is reality. They make reality for us. I look at this and I say it's a chair. And you look at it and you say it's a chair. And because we both agree that it's a chair, we share a world. But it's design. It's these things that we have made together that shape and make the world that we share together. And without it, we could not share anything. We could not have a common world. And so, if we're going to continue to improve our common world, we all need to be participants in the design of that world. I came across this quote last year when we were doing the Future Ways of Living uh, during the time of the Expo. We were thinking of redesigning social systems and I was charged with the, uh, leading the team that was looking at education and in an old bookstore I came across this book called Education in the New Age. It's written by Alice Bailey, who was the founder of the New Age movement. Now, I am not necessarily a New Age person, but this quote so captures what I feel about education. It says, education is or should be the continuous process from birth to death, concerned not so much with the acquisition of knowledge as with the expansion of consciousness. Knowledge in and of itself is a dead end unless it is brought into functioning relationship with the environment, with social responsibilities, historical trends, human and world conditions, and above all, with the evolution of consciousness which brings the infinite vastness of the universe within the finite range of the human mind. Really a beautiful thought about education. So what have we been doing with the Institute Without Boundaries? It's a collaborative design project that's trying to generate collaborative design practice in the world and move us towards generative design practices. We started by designing together and 14 students and Bruce Mao's office 
designed the Massive Change exhibition, which premiered in Vancouver and was seen by over a million people when it moved from Vancouver to Toronto uh, to Chicago. It was an exhibition that really had as a premise that in the future we have to design together, that we can improve our world by designing together. But as we've moved on and we've been working on different projects, from the Massive Change project we moved to the World House project, which starts from the house out to the neighborhood, to the city, to the region, to the nation. Uh, we started to understand that we were really involved in a project of systems design and that systems design is at the core of our future. And really, for industrial design, I think there's nothing more important than its re-projection into a, a concept of system design. We started to design the World House by analyzing different systems of housing over 12,000 years. And one of the things we realized is that design one of the fundamental parts of design is time. And really, we, we started to understand that the agricultural revolution was our way of overcoming terrain, and that the industrial revolution was our way of overcoming the problems of climate, and that our information revolution was really about uh, overcoming the problems of economy. And we also understood that this new revolution that we're moving into is really about overcoming the problems of culture and how we're going to live with many diverse cultures in a world together. So we also design systems of design. So we not only design projects, we design actually approaches to how you solve the projects. And this is an example when we're called from the government of Costa Rica to reimagine the relationship between the global hotel chains and the poor communities that they live side by side with. And so we had to design from a distance. So we started to imagine how do you design as a designer from a distance how do you give back power to the locals? How do you not impose solutions on them? So we came up with this dashboard, which actually is a way of deciding with them how you're going to design for them, discussing it in advance. We also have this principle of designing things into reality. This is the canoe home, a design that we did for a mobile housing unit that would embrace sustainability, universal design, intelligent design, and uh, we moved it 12 times. It takes a day to move and re-erect. Uh, and it's made using a philosophy that I invented called systematics. But the amazing thing was that it was seen by over a million people. And it was there to change how they saw design of their own houses. We did this with the Canadian Housing Corporation so that we could convince people to start reimagining the way they lived in a more sustainable way. We also try to imagine designing new ways of living. So what we've done in Milan with the future ways of living, we did in Toronto, rethinking transportation for the region. We actually had teams of 30 people that included professionals, citizen groups, and students working on solving sustainable transportation problems, new forms of public transit, new uh, individual personal transit forms. And we created exhibition that has influenced policy. In fact, many of the policy ideas that were pursued here are now being adopted by the Toronto government. But when I think of a life in design, I don't like to think of only the successes. There are many moments of success and many moments of failure. And one of the things I worry most about right now is how afraid we are of failure, how afraid we are of risk, how we don't want to try things because if we fail, it's going to have an impact on ourselves. I have failed many times, but actually those failures are what taught me things. I failed in my first job uh, when uh, I was in politic and I, I didn't say the right thing and I was let go. I failed uh, when I joined my association and I tried to convince them to educate the public and they didn't want to do it. I failed when I launched this art gallery for digital media in the distillery district and uh, and it didn't succeed. 
However, all of those failures brought me to a new place. They took me to somewhere uh, that I hadn't expected, and they gave me wisdom to confront many other things. And so from that, I was able to do many successes. I was able to create the first Live Work bylaw in the city of Canada that allowed and then transformed all of Canada to allow for living and working in the same place when it was forbidden previously. I did that with IBM. I founded the Architectural Literacy Forum and, and galvanized the architectural community. I invented something called the... I, I worked at the Design Exchange and I turned what was a failing institution into a succeeding institution. And I developed systematics and I've been working with the IWB and we've been doing really wonderful successes. And most recently I've been working with Renova on art, something that I never thought I would do in my whole life when I abandoned art when I chose design over art in uh, high school. So understanding these points of failure and success are important because if we don't fail and learn from failure, we'll never move forward. And we have to move forward because if we don't move forward, we're going to fall behind. And uh, my, my, perhaps my biggest success and my biggest failure was this thing that I dreamed up called the DXNet, which was a broadband network of design. It was invented in around 1998 and we made a portal for designers. We made a tool that allowed designers to design remotely with each other, 20 people, they would draw together, uh, they would work together online. It was an amazing thing. As we tried to bring it into the marketplace, we realized that the designers who were all uh, uh, specialists did not want to collaborate in real time. They, they wanted to actually work sequentially still, right? But it was actually the sequential work was what was actually making work difficult to improve. If you imagine you, you're designing a building and the architect designs the plan and then it goes to the engineer and he lays the columns over it. Then it goes back to the architect and the columns are in the voids. And then the architect says, ah, dannato ingegnere. And then it goes back to the engineer and the engineer says, ma stupido architetti che non sanno niente della struttura. So you can just imagine, right? But this is what we have to overcome because specialization took us to where we are, which is fantastic. We have houses for everyone. We have cities for everyone. But how are we going to have houses and cities that are environmentally sound? It's only when we're working together and speaking together. Now, it succeeded. It was amazing. And then it failed spectacularly because I pushed it too hard. I, uh, in, the sponsors actually thought it was going to be the answer to 9-11. And they pushed it to go public, and, and, and then it kind of imploded with the dot-com crash. But, you know, this is why we live, to do these things, right? And while I lost the DXNet, I gained two new jobs. I became a dean at George Brown College, and I became the head of the Institute Without Boundaries. And actually, I got to do what was really needed because I had this vision that we needed to move beyond sequential specialization in design, but it wasn't just the technology that was going to take us there. We actually had to prepare people's minds and hearts to work together. And that's what the Institute Without Boundaries does. It actually makes people want to work with each other as a team. And I ask you to ask anybody out there tonight who was in the charrette last week, and maybe they'll identify yourself, what they learned was just that. So, what did it bring me? Well, it brought me to a position of understanding that design was beyond the designer. That I really couldn't make good designs if I wasn't working with my clients. If I wasn't thinking about how I could empower them. Right? And it also taught me that by designing participation and interaction to design, when I was open to that input from others, all of a sudden my designs became way better, much better than I thought they could ever be. And finally, it made me understand that in the future, what we have to design are the effects, not the products, not the environments, not the services, but the effects. And I actually, what that opened up to me, most importantly, was that if I designed with time, I could actually change the effects over time and solve things that I could never solve 
if I was only designing thinking in a moment. So I realized that evolutionary design is the only way out of complex project problems. And we've done 80 or so charrettes around the world. They're all problems that have not been able to be solved for 20 years. And it's only by designing with time that we end up solving them. So at that time, in 2001, when I had failed, I tried to summarize for myself something that I call a temporal framework. It's something that I use every day. It's actually so important to me. I think it's the most important thing I've ever done. And I, what I was trying to do, I was making this company, and I was trying to understand what was the role of this company in time? What was it doing for the world? And I came up with this. I call it the real-time meditation because it's not something that's right. It's, uh, it's based on something called the Klein grid. The Klein grid is, uh, if you know Kinsey, Kinsey looked at sexuality, not in by, uh, by polar ways. He looked at it as a gradient. Uh, Klein looked at sexuality as a gradient over time because people's sexualities actually change over time. They're not only on a scale, they actually change over time. So what I tried to do is I tried to look at our worlds and, and put them into epochs and then to look at how things had changed over time in those epochs. So I remembered, uh, and this is kind of unique to maybe my experience, my parents left Italy um, and at the time they left after the Second World War, they lived in a very feudal world in central Italy. And then they went to Canada and they had to adjust to an industrial society. And I grew up in that industrial world, but surrounded in my neighborhood by this feudal world of, you know, 12 families all from the same town in Italy who had recreated their, their town in Toronto. And then I would go to school, to the industrialized school, but by the time I finished university, you know, I was living in the computer age and I had to start doing my drawings on computers, right? So it made me see in one lifetime three different epochs and how they worked. And so that first epoch is really an epoch of representation. You know, it's, you know, when the caveman puts the cow on the wall, he's representing and then all of them can divide and understand that image of the cow together. And so the representation, the image, is so important to create the unity in the society, right? However, in our industrial world, it's that abstraction, it's that capacity to abstract things. And if you think of language, you know, the alphabet is an abstraction, right? And it's by abstracting that all of a sudden uh, you get an industrialized economy. But in the future, and, and, and this is my guess, our economy is going to be about transfiguration. It's going to be how we take resources, manipulate them digitally, dematerialize them and rematerialize them. And so, as I look through at these different things, I created this kind of paradigms, right? Uh, you know, pictographic language, alphabetic, binaric, religion, ideology, cybernetics, the sign, the word, the code. It was just a way of thinking. It's not right, but it helps me think about things. It helps me look at how things are changing in time. So I came up with the Retail Manifesto, which is that the designer's role was to take material in the future, dematerialize it, and through digital tools imagine how it will be rematerialized, and and, and being able to do that, being able to spread things around the world. And the most obvious example at that time was, you know, we take a log and we make it into paper, right? And we put down our ideas. Then we put them into a computer and then that computer sends them across the globe through the internet and then they rematerialize in a, 3D, uh, a 2D printer and then they're circulated on the other side of the world, right? So this process was happening, and to me it seemed the fundamental process, and it's proven to be, because now we're doing this in 3D, and eventually we're going to do this in 4D, right? And what I realized was that in the original sort of feudal world, it was all about scale. We were prosumers. My mother's family, they made all their clothes, all their shoes. And they had to do that. 
There was a convention and then they individually adapted the convention to make their world. In an industrial world, you have something called economies of scale, where you make things with machines so you can make more things so people can have more things. My mother had one dress and one pair of shoes. I had hundreds of suits and dozens of shoes. I don't want to say how many my children have today, but there are hundreds of shoes and thousands of clothes, right? And in the future, we have this problem because we've created from a world of scarcity a world of abundance. I miei genitori mi dicevano sempre sei nato nell'abbondanza, non saprai vivere nel futuro. And, uh, and really, in the future, we need to create scalability because the abundance is strangling us, creating pollution problems, creating all sorts of issues. And what we have to determine is how do we divide up the world in a better way by making a scalable world enabled through digital tools. So these worlds, the economy of sovereignty and representation, I also remember my parents telling me, you're lucky you didn't grow up under a monarchy, right? right? And then we have the economy of incorporation and abstraction, where corporations are abstract entities that govern our world. But in the future, I think we're going to be facing an economy of quantification and transfiguration. And if I look at wisdom in these different eras, because there's always been wisdom, in the start there seemed to be wisdom from experience, the accumulation of experience that brought you wisdom. And then in our world of the, the last 200 years, it's studying, it's looking at the book that brings you wisdom, right? But I really believe in the future, it's not just looking at experiences and the book. We'll also have to become explorers. The only way to get wiser is to become researchers and experimenters. And the whole of society is going to take on that cast of research and experimentation. So, I've been working on a wisdom economy through learning and practice. And I finally decided, let's test this. And I had the great fortune to be invited by Anna Merone and Luisa Colina at the Politecnico to come have a, um, a, a studio here with their students. And we had 40 students and I worked with Virginia Tassinare and we said, let's imagine this wisdom economy, let's see what it could be. And it was amazing, it was like amazing. It was the start of, I think, this journey in Milan because they started to describe a different world because they had to imagine a world of how would you acquire wisdom. And so they started to make these stories about people talking in parks and spending their days together, solving problems. And it, it really, really inspired me. And it made me realize that we had to do the Future Ways of Living project. So what did we learn? These are the values that came out. And, and it was where people shared knowledge and stories instead of hoarding them. That's a wise world. And if you think about it, so many times we're hoarding knowledge and not sharing it openly. And if people assembled freely without borders and barriers, that would be a wise world. And that if difference was not marginalized, but welcomed and integrated, it would be even wiser, the world. And if the world that we have, which is a world of the either or, for the last 500 years, by thinking this is that, that is that, we've progressed so much. But in the future, actually, we start to, we need to make a world of the both and. Not of the either or, because the either or creates conditions of exclusion, right? We have to imagine win-wins. That's the only way that we're going to take things forward. If we're always imagining either ors, someone is going to end up on the short end of the stick. And so we learned that. This is a project we did in Lota in Chile. We went down to Lota because they had an earthquake and 10,000 people were homeless. And so we worked with them for a year to try to help them deal with this problem. But what did we discover? We discovered that the homelessness was the least of their problem. Their problem was that everyone used to work in the mine, in the one industrial entity that was there. And the mine was gone. It was used up and there was no future. And so we actually had to work with them to help them believe that they did not have to wait for the government or the mine company to make their future. 
The only way they could make their future was understanding that it's people yourselves that change places. So we made with them hundreds of small projects that they have actually been executing on their own and actually Lotta has been improving. And one of the things that we realized, this is an image from last year's Future Ways of Living, uh, Charette, is that when we harness everybody's creativity, we expand the potential and the possible solutions that are available. And if everyone, this is the most important thing, if everyone is part of creation, everyone gets to feel the benefit of creativity. My friends who are not designers always say, oh, I wish I had your job, I wish I could create things. My life is so boring, right? So we have to return creativity to the people because it's actually one of the most powerful and beautiful things of life. And if we do that, we actually build their wisdom. So what is economy? It's basically the customs of the house. It's not numbers or finances. It's our modes of behavior. And what is creativity? It's the generating of the new, the valuable. What is education? It's the process of facilitating learning. It's not the books. It's the process that we learn. And what is wisdom? It's just the quality of having experience, knowledge and good judgment. But really, we do these uh, in the wisdom economy by designing time-based transformation, by storytelling and sharing, by open and transparent designs that can spread, and by creating an inclusive world. Really, the wisdom economy really requires of us to think the way Leonardo did, of the world as a flow of systems and how those systems are interacting with each other and how we can intervene in them in the right way so that we keep them in equilibrium and keep them moving forward and improving. And as complexity increases, the difficulty of making those interventions increases as well. So here it is, like we have customs and we have education to get us more wisdom so that we can be more creative so that we can have better customs. And you can start anywhere in this. As the great Canadian painter Lauren Harris said, there is no finality. It's a process of continuous evolution. This is the favorite thing I've ever made, and it comes from deep experience, failing at innovation and succeeding. Innovation doesn't happen unless you have it in an ecology. It usually starts with some kind of social innovation, some kind of virtualization of yourself. How do you want to live? How do you want to be different? When women did not want to stay at home anymore, they were virtualizing a new reality for themselves, right? So it starts there. But of course, it needs a design innovation. It needs actually to be visualized, what would that be? So when women sought liberation, they had to visualize how their lives would be different. Otherwise, they couldn't move toward that new space. And so they had to redesign their lives, right? And then it needs a technical innovation, which is how does that make feasible? Well, in that case, we had to actually change the men. Because women liberated themselves, but the men still didn't change, right? And so nothing was technically feasible for them, right? And then we need to actually have a business innovation, and business innovation is always how we propagate this. How do we spread it, right? And finally, we need political innovation, because if there isn't legitimization of the change, the change does not become a common recurring thing. Now, all of this stuff has to happen, or you get caught. If you can't figure out the technical innovation, the design innovation doesn't go forward. And if you don't finish, figure out the business innovation, you fail like Apple did at the start, right? That's why Microsoft uh, uh, beat him, right? And then he returned because he's figured it out. And he figured out the ecology of innovation. So here we are, we're in this trilogy. It started with the Wisdom Economy Workshop. It had the Future Ways of Living event that we did last year. And now it's this workshop that we're doing about the Expo site as a global village, applying our ideas about the wisdom economy and seeing how they will play out in a territory using that ecology of innovation to test and make those ideas come true. And so 
what are we doing? We're having a global encounter, people came from around the world, to redesign the social systems. We're having international capabilities and resources being brought together. We're confronting the challenge of global systems. Because in last year's charrette, when we went back to Toronto and we looked at the work, we realized every project was actually a project about the arrival of the global village. Now, Marshall McLuhan, years ago, very close to Alice Bailey, predicted that a world would become a global village. And it's actually happening. Our services are becoming globalized. There's Uber in every city. There's Airbnb in every corner of the universe. Everything is being redesigned to be global service. So what we need to do is a whole systems rethink. And so we did last year, 60 people, 20 countries, 18 gurus, a book, we made a movie. These are the projects we came up with last year. They led us to some really interesting problematics. So we say we're going to have a global village, but there's all sorts of problems. First of all, there's boundaries everywhere, right? Are we going to accept people being able to transgress those boundaries? To create a world that's transparent and open, all of a sudden there's going to be a loss of privacy. Are we ready to accept a loss of privacy? If we have to have better health care through information about our behaviors, people are going to know our bad behavior as well. Are we ready for people to know our bad behavior? We're coming upon a world of artificial intelligence that's going to be prompting even more change, sending people into disoccupation because things are being organized in a global way. In fact, all the problems we've been solving in the last 10 years at the Institute have all had to do with global dislocation, creating problems in local areas. In Costa Rica with global tourism, in Ireland with the loss of industry out of the country. It's just all about this global restructuring, right? So how are we going to deal with that? How are we going to deal with democracy and freedom? When democracy and freedom doesn't exist everywhere, are people going to change? And how are we going to keep values and traditions? Are we going to turn the world into the same place everywhere? Right? And how are we going to allow difference while maintaining cohesion? Amazing issues. So speaking idealistically of the global village is actually a real problem. And so we also saw a set of values that were coming out. Really, we're all part of a world house. You know, no, the line between Canada and the United States, if you're polluting on the south part of the line, the pollution goes to the north, right? This is the reality of uh, the world, right? So these are the kind of values that were coming out, holistic systems, transparency, the idea that different is better than perfect, we don't all have to be the same, that we have to share more, the hardest one, right? Huh. That the personal is political. That we're going to, in a way, we have to learn to be scouts. That we're going to be involved in massive change. And from me to we and to back again. So, so we arrive this year with this understanding and we think, how are we going to apply this to the expo site? And the expo site is really a total uh, representation of all the problems that we have in the world. It's a geopolitically significant site. It's got high-speed rail from France to Slovenia. It's got connection with that Malpensa to the world. It has local subways. It has train stations. It has prison. It has postal. But it even has a moat all the way around it. So all the problems of the world, the problems of the prisons, the problems of disoccupation, the problems of the post office that's going to disappear with the digital, the problems that you can't get to it even though it has every highway and transportation model to get you there. The expo is emblematic of everything that we have to fix in our world. And so it's an amazing opportunity to do a laboratory. If you think about it, maybe there's no other place in the world right now that is so ready to become the laboratory for our 21st century urbanism. Here we can test automated transport, we can test green roofs, we can test everything because it's there and it's open and it's all plugged and all that's missing is actually the participation of the citizenry 
of the levels of government, of the institutions, to pull something together and give an example for the world of what we should live like in this next century. And, and so what have we done, thanks to Andrea? We've brought people to Milan. We brought a global village together to make a global village. And that's what was so exciting about these past weeks. And if we do this right, and if we give to the citizens of Milan something through this work that inspires them to come together and join together and do and continue this work, we will have done our job because we're really helping you imagine a world created by design after design. And what is that? Well, as I mentioned, the world, original world design was communal, then design became empirical, and in the future it will be generative and collaborative, and I'll explain that later on. But if I contrast the designer of the 20th century, because now I want to speak a bit, because it's World Industrial Design Day, and it's the moment to consider what will our design be. You know, the 20th century design, and this, you know, I learned this from Enzo Mari, you know, this great person who came to Toronto and told me, Luigi, cos'è questa città? È un Babilonia, non sa di nulla. Questa è la città di Toronto, right? Like, you know, it's a nothing, right? He said. And I said, no, 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 we have weak culture. And he said, ma, che cazzo è weak culture, right? <laughs> what is this, right? So I had to walk him around because, you know, he said, Italy is strong culture. We have lots of things, right? And I said, yeah. But what you don't have is enough weakness to accept others. So I took him to Kensington Market to see the, the, the way we lived. And at the end of the day, he was sitting there drawing sketches, his beautiful sketches, to my children. And he said, Forse ho capito cos'è questo weak culture, right? And, but, you know, he's the one who told me that the designer worked on behalf of the people. That's why he was so important, the designer. He serviced the entrepreneur and the industrialist who helped people. And he developed designs based on knowledge that could be multiplied by machines so that everyone could have something. So important, because so many people in the world don't have anything. But the designer of this new century, he's going to design with people, and she is going to design with people. And they're going to be a designpreneur, because it's not enough to design for an entrepreneur. In fact, you need to make the project, you need to be the entrepreneur. You need to bring the product to the world. And they're going to identify opportunities through visualization, they're going to prototype through simulation, and they're going to build evolutionary systems through interaction that can evolve intelligently. They're going to agilely design in the way that software is developed. And they're going to do this in the physical, in services, in organizations, in the new areas of design. This design of the 21st century, it's global. It's interdisciplinary. It's systematic and it's entrepreneurial. Because the global economy is a digital economy, that's what makes it a global economy. And it renders design a collaborative design practice that is digital by necessity. When I became president-elect in 2001, just like Luisa is today, I helped found something called the International Design Alliance. We tried to bring together all the design associations, IFI, Icograda, and we did for a short period of time, for 10 years. At that time, I posted 10 design challenges that we had to solve. Aging, sustainable transportation, uh, affordability of shelter. And we were going to work on it. But the IDA came and it went. But a global economy requires interdisciplinary global organizations. And so I was super proud that even though the IDA fell apart, ICSID decided to rename itself the World Design Organization and to welcome all designers into its organization and to herald the need for a solutions economy because we need solutions, not products. And so I rethought these, and I think this is going to show you what the difference is in the design in the next few years. We are going to have to design an economic system that distributes wealth to more people 
and more equitably and sustainably. What has the American election been about? It's been about wealth inequality. Right? So now, you know, for designers who are designing chairs and stuff like that, it's going to be a change to start to think of how do I design an economy. But we won't do it alone as industrial designers. We're going to do it by working with economists and others, right? And a transportation system, but they need us because they need us to reimagine and not just analyze, right? And that's the important thing that a designer does. They reimagine and they propose, right? And we're going to need a transportation that's automated and it moves things without impacting the planet. And we're going to need an education system that increases wisdom and that lasts a whole life long. And that's very modular. And if anyone doubts that the reason Microsoft bought LinkedIn and Linda, it's because they want to build that system and they want to control it. And we need a healthcare. And if our public systems don't change, we're in trouble. Uh, because it will become privatized. And a healthcare and pri public education is actually one of the most important things in the world. In fact, I'd say it is the most important thing. Because I know this from my parents, because that's what they gave me. They gave me a public education, which is why I'm standing in front of you today. A healthcare system that provides well being physically, mentally to people, modeling healthy living. That's what we need. We need an employment system that brings opportunity to all. How many people are skilled, but they don't have a chance to work? How much work is too concentrated in too few people? And we need a cultural system that fosters diverse expression. This one's going to be the hardest. Uh, and yet it provides individuation and social cohesion. How can we preserve our diverse cultures and yet have them work together? The reason I have hope for this is Toronto is a bit like this right now. And if I encourage you to visit it to see it. And finally, we needed to have sustainable shelter and housing. That's the most really critical thing. And everyone needs to be housed. So those are the challenges. So on this World Industrial Design Day, I, I, I'm just going to bring a challenge out to you all. Uh, as industrial designers, I want you to try to think of doing something maybe a bit extraordinary. And that's to take 10% of your time to work together, to take your best resource, your capabilities, which are this incredible creativity, and to freely give it to an important public project and to trans do transformative research with that project, to raise money for these projects so that they can become real, and to work with citizens. You know, we all have to work for somebody. We all do. You know, all of us work for someone. Even when you own your own company, you're working for someone. But actually, it's when we make time to work everybody, for everybody, that it makes a difference. And we don't have to do it all the time, but just enough of it changes everything. So, you know, take 90% of your time to earn your living. But take 5% to innovate and do collaborative research and 5% to work with projects that you know are going to make a difference in people's lives. It's one evening a week. It's one week twice a year. It's one summer every two years. But I can guarantee you that doing that, it's going to transform the rest of your 90% of your time. And I can say it personally because, you know, I came here to do a charrette for 10 days for roughly a week with people here. And, you know, before that, I was running a school. And it's a shit job, let me tell you. It's hard work, right? And I have lots of bosses. The students, 3,500 of them. The faculty, another 400 of them, okay? And then the administration, right? And then the government, right? But, you know, this week with people here, it changes everything. It helps because I know that I've helped the city of Milan in some way. I've worked with people that I, I really esteem heavily. And more than that, I've seen young people change, grow. Uh, I've seen them happy. I've seen them motivated. So it doesn't take a lot to change things. It just takes us doing it together. 
I took a big risk last year, and in one month I renovated a space called Civis. Civis is the Roman for citizen. And the idea is that we are all designers and creatives working together collaboratively for creative system change. We're locating it next to the school, so the students can come, the teachers can come, people can work there, and we're going to do this work. And I'd love to see those in every city, and I'd love to see them working together. <sighs> My own personal story is of a life spent working on the both end. It's part of a story in Canada. It's a story of, of the indigenous people who came there who were also immigrants across the Bering Strait. And the immigrants who came from France and England and then Italy and other parts of the world. And the refugees, like my wife, who's a refugee from Chile and from the terrible dictatorship of Pinochet. We are the society of indigenous immigrants and refugees. We are the society of the both and. In fact, in Canada, you never say that you're Canadian. It's only when you leave that you say you're Canadian. In Canada, I say I'm Italian-Canadian. My son argues with me, he goes, Daddy, Daddy, you've got to be Canadian. And I say to him, but Marcello, I can't be. I'm Italian. I'm Canadian. I want to be the both and. And his is even more complicated because he's got three, two of which are really difficult, Italian and Chileans, not so easy. And then the Canadian part. But really, I was underlying this in a very difficult point in my life. I had taken over the School of Design, and I was working with faculty that were very difficult and who had not changed for many years. And they had made my life really uh, difficult. And I, I just didn't have the strength to deal with them. So I went to seek help. I went to a support group. Like, most people do and don't like to admit that they've done. And I did, and I went to the support group, and it was, you know, I was there in my suit, and there was this, you know, this fat woman, you know, who was really poorly dressed, and then there was this man, and he had cystic fibrosis and cerebral palsy, and he could hardly speak, and he was there every week for the few weeks that I went to this group, and to speak he had to hold a piece of paper with letters and he had to point at the letters to tell me what he needed to say to me. He had to have a piece of design to talk to me. And, uh, and I said, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know if I can stay in this position. I don't know if I can take this. I don't know if I have what it takes to make this a better school. And he said, well, Luigi, you do because you have, and he spelt out these words, you have the gift of change. And it hit me, it hit me, I'm, I'm feeling it right now. I'm feeling a push through my body because what he made me realize was that anything can be changed. It really can, as long as you believe that you have the gift to change it. And so I went back and I changed the school and then within three years it was in the top 60 design schools in the world and, and you know, and then it became, the, you know, the IW became in the top four urban design programs in the world, etc. But it was the wisdom of this man who could barely speak and it was a profound lesson that I learn every day, every day at the IWB. We do projects. For Costa Rica, we had a project with 45 different design firms and student groups designing the social housing unit. And we decided to give the project to 10-year-old elementary school students. And at the end, we had 46 projects. The only project to look at earthquakes for the housing was the children's project. So wisdom comes from everywhere. I went back, I listened to my staff who I thought were so difficult, and actually what I had to learn was to listen, because to become wiser, I had to listen. And, um, and so I did. And in this time period, I've been trying to create an example. I work with many people, they all help me on these projects. 
But in the time that I have left, I work on what I call systematics, which is my version of collaborative and uh, generative system design, especially generative system design. And uh, its principle is that the future of design lies in creating systems that allow people to co-create designs for themselves. And its method is that it's scalable, it's interactive, it's modular, and it uses a simulation. Really, it's combined of holonic recombinant elements, if people know Keisler. And it's guided by variable dimensional material and formal systems. We create evolutionary products, environments, communications and services that allow for collaborative creation, production and consumption. But for me, this is really the essence of systematics. It's that the dream that everything can become more than one thing, that everything can be a both and, and that by its transfiguration in context with other things, it can truly live forever. And I've been trying to prove this and test this in small design projects. It's generative. It creates complex objects. I'll go through this quickly. It develops archetypal elements. They, they transform. Multiple materials. Stretched. Combined. So here is the first example. I made a sketch on my book 14 years ago of this. It starts with a point becomes a line, becomes a plane, is substantiated and becomes something that's elemental. It's duplicated, it's conjoined, it's replicated, and then all of a sudden it becomes an archetype. That archetype is a bench in this case. Okay? But then you can stack it and create a bench shelf. And then you can put it on its side and create a bench wall. And then you can rotate it and create a seat. And then you can offset it and make a stair. And then you can arrange it and make a bed. And then you can reset them all to make a table and chairs. And to make a couch and a coffee table. And a kitchen. And a desk. And you can make it out of any material. And you can size it how you need to size it. And voila, you have a bench world. And if you have the software, everyone can interact with that world and make it. And so we've been making it at the School of Design. We've been using it to make the classrooms. We've been using it to make the faculty offices. I've been using it to make artworks. And this was perhaps most telling. I made these artworks and actually the people could change them. They could participate in redesigning them. And after the show was finished, everyone stole them. And they became furniture in their desks. And they never disappear. So they're truly sustainable because they're being reinterpreted over time. They're not being thrown in the garbage. We bought IKEA furniture, it's being thrown in the garbage every year. This is persisting. Here they are rearranged again, and rearranged again into a canoe home, and rearranged to work with Renova. So you can see how it can work at a larger scale, and rearranged again. And there you can see a city that's made of these things, and that can probably be rearranged again. And then I developed a second version to test it further, the methodology, and this I call the open lattice. The open lattice is me what Canadian society is. It's this weak structure that creates definition and yet allows for things to flow through and around it. It allows for you to transform it and reimagine yourself. So it's based on a cross and a square. It was like a zero and a one. And it made furniture, and it made exhibitions, and you can see the students transforming it, and you can see it making different things, and you can see it making pavilions, and you can see it making a whole exhibition, and you can see it creating almost any form that you could ever imagine. And you can see that it changes, and it's the same two elements. So the goal of this experiment, of the systematics, and I've done many more, but I, I won't bore you with them, is really this goal of eventualization. It's a term that I use, but what I mean by it is, is that we need to eventualize, we need to bring everyone into a story, and we need to let them flow and be part of that story, and we need to give them space to be part of our society. And I learned this lesson at George Brown because one of the most special things about our school, George Brown, is that it has everyone in it. 
and it really accepts everyone and it brings them into it and it changes their lives. And for me, all of a sudden, after years of working as an architect and a business person and as a director of a cultural center and thing, I realized my, finally maybe my dad would be proud of me because I was working on this project of eventualization. So, my favorite example, though, of this collaborative and generative design is a project I did last year with Renova. I worked with a team of people, you can see them here. They actually include my children, and they include many people from the IWB. And we did a project, and it called it the Lovers of the River Almonda, and that project was about human love. And what we did is we interviewed people, we invited them to come down, interview themselves, and be photographed. And uh, with a few simple questions, I would write a 15-line poem while they were photographed by Wojtek Pendrak, who's I think here as well. Uh, and then actually the poem would be combined with the uh, photograph and then would be given to them so that they could be shared. And part of the process was the couple coming back and me reading the poem to them. And so, why was this project so special? Because actually they were creating the artwork with me and I was interacting with them in a deep way about their lives. And what it was doing, it was, it was really bringing us into closer relationship. And it was amazing because uh, this is one of my professors, she's from Iran, and her husband is uh, uh, an engineer from Iran as well. They've lived in France, and then in Montreal, and then now in Toronto, which they're happy to call their home. So they came down, and we asked the questions, and then I wrote them a poem. So I read the poem to them. This is a poem from him to her. Bahar, how is it your smile blinded me? Your eyes deafened me. I lost all sense of time. Boredom vanished, life a journey. The heights of the Albors down to the great inland sea, where my quiet was filled by your music, your noise, your excitement at living. After I read the poem, Hamayun, he, he got up and his eyes welled up and then he, he had to go away and she said, don't worry Luigi, he's not upset. She said, he's crying, he's happy. So he came back, tears pulled out of his eyes and he said, thank you. It's 30 years, I'm an engineer, I've never been able to say to my, life, my wife how I love her and you've enabled me to say it to her. I mean, that's a moment, it's an extraordinary moment, but there wasn't one, there was 200. And the system that I had set up allowed my son to write poems and my daughter who's only 15, 17 to write poems and my wife and they transformed together we transformed 225 people's lives right and actually that same process is what we're doing right now in this last week at the Cascina Triuzza we had all of these people coming together to work together to collaborate to share our lives to deepen our relationships and imagine things for the future that were more positive and so in 10 days, think about it, in 10 days we made a book, a summer school, a movie, an exhibition and left this for you. I encourage you all to go out to see it and to see the results of the work. We did the Opera of Duomo with the Triennale and I have to tell you, we couldn't have done it. We had to work with them, and without them, we couldn't have done it. And without Meet the Media Guru people, we couldn't have done it. And without everyone else, but it was because we had all pulled together to do it at all costs that we were able to do it, because it could have failed all the way through. So, what did we come up with, which is this thing that we're leaving for you, citizens of Milan, about this possibility for the site of Expo. It's summarized perhaps by the great Jane Jacobs, citizen of New York and Toronto. She said, cities have the capability of providing something for everybody only because and only when they are created by everybody. And so we imagined this new urbanism of the 21st century 
and we imagine overcoming the problems that the Expo has. They have a $260 million debt left over from the Expo. They have the need for probably a billion and a half to $2 billion of investment to be able to start the site going. And it's going to need $2 trillion, I've calculated, of final build-out. And what we proposed is, you know, that site has a million 100,000 square meters of space and probably will build out to 5 million square meters of space. What if everyone were to purchase a action, a share, in the planning process for this site? To eliminate the debt would only be 275 do, uh, euros a share. And you would have a group of people committed. They would be able to vote for their share and their money going to help plan the health care, the schools, the businesses, the parks, the housing. They would be voting with their shares and helping start and precipitate the planning of those things. And then uh, with additional money, actually, sorry, that $275 not only generated paying down of the debt, it generated a billion and a half dollars to start the temporary occupation and the restructuring of the site. And then there would become another phase where actually people would have the rights, the first right who invested, to buy and become part of the community in a longer term. So this was our proposition. As I said to you, every time I go to the Expo, I come to Milan, I'm struck by the Duomo. And this time it was by this phrase, Maria Nascenti, right? It, it was very important to me. I was in between meetings. We've been working like 20 hours a day here, right? And in between meetings, I walked and I snapped a picture. And then I thought, this thing is really a symbol of birth. It's the birth of Mary, right? In Latin. So it's a symbol of our continuing to birth things as a society. And uh, it made me very emotional because my mother's name is Maria. And... Uh, and she's not nascenti now. She's a source of great wisdom for me, both my mother and my father. She, here she is in this picture, at a wedding two weeks ago before I came here. But she is Maria Moriens because she has Alzheimer's disease. And in the last four years, I am watching the slow degradation of her wisdom and her losing everything that was so important to her because she didn't have money. Uh, she's a beautiful woman, but the thing she prized most was that she had a mind, right? And it's going. But it also made me realize something very deep and powerful, which is that we're all born and that we're all going to go here I can remember my mother at 45 starting to wear glasses and here are my naninis and I got them at 45. In a weird way, everything is predictable. I am going to face the faith that my mother is going to be facing. My hair turned gray at the same age. All the patterns are the same. In fact, it's so easy to predict everything. It's happening right in front of us all the time. So what stands in the way of that reality? It's human commitment, those doctors that are working to solve this. And there's many of them around the world, doctors, nurses. It's my mother herself taking part in a test, right? It's what we choose to do. You know, it's actually what we choose to focus on that makes all the difference and that maybe can change that reality for her and me. I was at the issue and that's when I really realized it. Our world, what's happening in our world is all predictable. If we keep going where we're going, not good things are coming. My mom, one of the last things that she could say coherently was that the, this time now reminds her of the time before World War II, where things were so confusing. Everything was so confusing. People were saying all these confusing things. 
And, you know, as a 10 to 12 year old girl, she just didn't understand what was happening. But what was happening is very many negative things leading to a negative place. We have to commit. We have to commit. We have to collaborate and design a way out of the predicted future that's unfolding right now. We have to design different effects. We have to design not the effect of division, but the, the effect of unification. Tolerance. We have to design these effects or else we'll head someplace terrible. And I saw the Boccioni exhibition and this beautiful image of his wife, who was obviously terribly, terribly in love with this woman and this face that is looking at him knowingly. We know that Boccioni died in the war and we lost a great talent in Italy and Milan. That we, when I saw this, I saw her looking at him knowing maybe this is the drawing before he went back to the front. It's all about what we do and what we emphasize. So I'm asking you, I'm asking you to help make a miracle in Milan. The Expo site could be Milan's miracle. It could be its gift to this 21st century. If we all come together locally and even people from around the world to help, we can make this thing. We can work together to make something special. But if you don't want to work on the Expo site, choose a project of your own. All of us can work on something that can make that difference. And we can build this global village that needs to be become a beacon for the world, some place that we can move towards, not some place that we can fall into, into a dark pit. Thank you for listening. Ci sediamo. Forse, beh, gli direi anche applauso, grazie per questa tua appassionante lecce, discorso, storia. Grazie per te ancora, eh? l'applauso per te, grazie. Beh, eh, se diamo un po' di luce alla, alla platea, grazie, così vi vediamo anche noi. Beh, eh, credo che sia stata le, la relazione più densa di, della storia degli 11 anni di Mitte Medio Guro. Densa di, di passione. No, non era una critica. Scusi. Lui capisce no, no. benissimo l'italiano. No, 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 è un, un complimento, voglio dire. Non riuscivamo a staccare dalle tue parole. Era, era come avere eh, appunto continuamente delle delle suggestioni, degli spunti, qualcosa in cui a ognuno di noi penso, eh, non voglio interpretare il pensiero di tutti, ma io eh, qualcosa a cui ti puoi anche attaccare perché questa idea di un design collaborativo, di un approccio così alla, alla vita, ai temi, eccetera, lo sentiamo molto, pensiamo veramente che sia, questa è un'epoca davvero straordinaria anche per le potenzialità, per gli strumenti, per la, la, no, tutto quello di cui possiamo disporre veramente per poter per poter agire. Quello che mi sembra interessante del suo intervento è anche tra tutte le cose questo fatto di, eh, insomma, di avere una predisposizione, di, una predisposizione alla sperimentazione, alla ricerca continua, all'interrogarsi continuamente, a progettare in una dimensione così inclusiva, collaborativa, quindi lo trovo veramente straordinario. Eh, beh, nel tempo se c'è una o due domande volentieri, poi ci... Eh, sento che c'è una densità di, di, di attenzione, veramente, guarda Luigi, grazie, grazie sì. perché ci portiamo a casa veramente tanto, tanto e... e poi un intervento di cuore proprio. Beh, c'è qualcuno che vuole chiedere qualcosa o... No, non voglio scoraggiarvi, la rete era connessa, c'erano varie persone che ci seguivano. È un po' il vostro momento, se desiderate approfondire qualcosa, c'è un microfono che gira. Posso parlare sì. in italiano? Sì, 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 sì assolutamente. Allora, ringrazio moltissimo perché appunto 
una grande densità e l'ultima citazione che hai fatto mi fa pensare a una cosa che mi mette i brividi perché Boccioni era milanese e forse il futurismo che per tanti anni è stato considerato un movimento più di provocazione e polemica in realtà è stato secondo me un secondo rinascimento perché eh, l'elaborazione è andata molto, molto più in là di quello che uno si può immaginare se tu pensi a Sant'Elia che è lui sì che è morto al fronte eh, non avendo potuto realizzare niente se tu pensi ai disegni di Sant'Elia ti puoi immaginare tutto il novecento no? allora l'idea che eh, ci possa essere pensato un secondo rinascimento in una città che ha un cantiere aperto da 700-800 anni io trovo che sia una cosa splendida veramente bellissima e ti ringrazio di questa ispirazione ho visto la mostra anch'io invito tutti ad andarla a vedere perché è, eh, ha una cifra eh, di, di intenzione veramente altissima eh, ti devo deludere invece sulla morte di Boccioni perché sì, morì soldato sì. ma cade da cavallo ah, a Verona cavallo, quindi... sì. scusi <ride> no, niente. ti ringrazio grazie, molto grazie per questo ser... ha qualche altra domanda? una qui, una qui, due Qua c'è una, qui in prima fila, grazie. Prima? Sì. Enrica Baccini. Grazie, io mi dispiace, Enrica. devo fare una domanda molto tecnica, molto poco pathos, ma sono, pathos. Eh, <ride> sono molto affascinata da questa wisdom, wisdom economy che, eh, che stai disegnando e che, con cui stai appunto facendo grande innovazione e raccogliendo anche il lavoro di tanti. Eh, sono curiosa se stai già lavorando con degli economisti su questa cosa, eh, perché si sente tanto parlare in economia di design thinking, no? ma applicato magari a oggetti piuttosto che modelli di business, di singole imprese, ma fare il design proprio di nuovi sistemi economici per risolvere grandi problemi sociali è molto affascinante, quindi mi piacerebbe sapere se ci sono già degli economisti che ti stanno seguendo in questo... In questo pensiero. Abbiamo contatti con economisti, però non stiamo lavorando fortemente con loro adesso, in questo momento. Però ci, ci sono degli esempi, eh, per esempio il Santa Fe Institute, con l'Evolutionary econ Economics, sta ripensando l'economica classica e, come, e, e stanno imparando molto facendo questo compito, lo fanno ogni anno, si rincontrano in questo stesso metodo di incontrarci e, e, e pensarci. Uh, Avrei, eh, davvero abbiamo studenti che hanno studiato l'economia che vengono dal nostro programma però mi, mi piacerebbe molto lavorare con, i, con, con, i, con gli economisti uh, e forse ce la faremo Sta, stiamo pensando anzi ho incontrato della gente qui a Milano che vorrebbe fare una cosa simile io penso che questo è molto importante sarà un lavoro molto difficile perché mettere insieme persone che sono diverse, all'inizio hai bisogno di creare un linguaggio comune e, a, e questo è difficile all'inizio, eppure poi quelli che sono addetti a, a fare analysis sono poco predisposti di creare. E questo è un problema perché ci vuole anche l'analysis però ci vuole anche la creazione, perché puoi analizzare le cose, sapere come funzionano, però no, non cambia nulla questo, se, no è, se non è portato all'uso del progetto. Allora queste sono cose da ridefinire, è un, è, un, è un lavoro molto difficile, però sono pronto eh? e parlo con ogni economista che incontro, parlo con loro. Di Io non possibilità. annuncio niente, ma sappiate che andremo avanti su Beh. questi temi della, della no, metodologia di design partecipativo, collaborando qui a Milano in maniera stretta, continuativa, con l'Istituto Without Boundary, con Luigi Ferrara. Un'altra domanda, ho visto lì? Uh, buonasera a tutti. Uh, unfortunately, I need to speak English for me. It's easier. Um, it, I was really impressed by your presentation, uh, and what really impressed me is your connection with your motherland. I mean, with Italy. Uh, and uh, curiosity is where uh, you've uh, you've 
you have been born in Canada, right? Yes. Yeah, that's really impressed me because uh, somehow you were uh, not thinking only about your personal uh, growth, but also about your connection to your motherland, to Italy. So it was um, so impressing for me. And I would like to thank you that uh, even if I'm not still uh, a citizen of Italy, but I'm so proud for Italians that you have such kind of uh, uh, citizens, even if they are abroad, even if they are born abroad, they still think about Italy. And I think you should be proud of that. So, and thank you very much uh, for this uh, opportunity to, uh, to hear your uh, uh, your speech and I'm also very happy for the people that you've been working together uh, I mean in the sense that uh, about Earth Week and uh, about Global Village it's really uh, make me think about uh, that we are all uh, even if we are different na uh, nationalities living in different uh, places uh, we are all together and we can make some uh, things together. So uh, I really impressed uh, by the work that you did and you make me to think about nicer things because somehow uh, uh, these days we are hearing too many bad news uh, around the world. So I'm very happy today being here. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Se c'è qualcun altro, ancora una domanda oppure una, una riflessione? Altrimenti vabbè, ringraziamo ancora una volta Luigi, ma soprattutto ringrazio voi anche per essere stati qua con noi. Si sentiva in questo pathos, questa serata così densa, la presenza di tutti, l'attenzione di tutti. Mi comunicavano anche dalla, dalla regia che appunto anche le persone in rete scrivevano che c'erano talmente tanto da, da ascoltare, da su cui riflettere che, che proprio hanno insomma si sono quasi trattenuti nel, nel commentare come normalmente di solito fanno poi sono scatenati tutti i twitter comunque e quindi la conversazione, il dialogo e le idee sono circolate come sempre e per, veramente grazie per la vostra partecipazione raccoglieremo, metabolizzeremo un po' il catering. messaggio c'è un catering, non è finito quindi un momento adesso ci portiamo fuori c'è ancora della luce, ci rivediamo e... bene, l'appuntamento, fermi tutti, annotatevi 27 luglio con a Padurai alla Triennale di Milano chiudiamo il ciclo di questo Future Ways of Living vi invito veramente ad andare alla Cascina Triulsa a guardare il risultato del lavoro straordinario di questi sette giorni di lavoro che non sto a ripetere ma soprattutto anche a fare tutto un percorso perché alla nell'area Expo sono, ci sono delle, alcune mostre una mostra City After the City vista in maniera una mostra multimediale appascinante dove ritroverete tante anche lì suggestioni, spunti per riflettere un po' su questo tema della, della, del nostro, della nostra epoca, insomma della nostra contemporaneità eh, con lo sguardi su tutto il mondo e su quelle che sono diciamo, le evoluzioni no? nella nostra società, della nostra società, nella vita, nella città. Eh, quindi siete tutti quanti invitati anche a conservare questo giornale giallo, chi è già, già seguito nelle puntate precedenti ha un bollino, <ride> ricordatevi di applicarlo e alla fine con Apadura ci ritroveremo e, e chiuderemo un po' il, il percorso di tutta questa ricerca che abbiamo fatto insieme grazie anche alla collaborazione della Triennale di Milano. Grazie veramente e adesso ci vediamo fuori, a presto. Grazie Luigi. Mm-hmm.